Well, it felt um, fitting that we were creating this space for other people, and neither Kevin or I had sat in the seat to tell, and so I felt like, okay, well, I'll, I'll do it. I tried to get him to do it, but he didn't want to do it, so um, I'll do it. And I thought, well, maybe no one will come, and it'll be easy. And then, like, all of you came, so, um, so thank you. Uh, so I thought a lot about what I wanted to share um, tonight, and I went back to really my family story and a bit of my roots. And because this has been so much about creating a sense of community, um, I really started to think about that a lot. And I am really um, passionate about um, my origins in two cities that I think are like the two of the most amazing places. So my father comes from New York, um, and my mother comes from New Orleans. And so I have this blend of being from these two um, amazing places. And they've become a part of my story and a part of, of uh, my journey here to New Haven. So I thought I'd share a little bit about that. Um, whenever anybody asks me, I always um, have responded that I come from a small family. And as I started to think about that, I thought that was sort of an interesting narrative. Um, and I think it's driven from the, part, from the fact that my immediate family was a small family. Um, and it was um, my mother and my father, and I have an older sister, um, Aislinn, whose name is a blend of both of my parents' names. And she's two years older than, than myself. Um, and so typically, our household was the four of us. And because where we lived, I grew up in different parts of New York State, um, and we moved as my father's job changed. Um, and so because we, wherever we were living was rooted in his employment, we were never in a place where there was other extended family. And so I really, in my head, had this story of, of having come from a small, uh, a small family. And that narrative really continued um, and I think grew strength because um, my parents died very young. And um, so when I was 17, uh, which would have been in 1985, both of my parents passed away of uh, different forms of cancer. And after a, about a year-long um, battle uh, from my mother and a shorter one from my father, um, my sister and I found ourselves uh, without a sort of home base. And so this sense of being from a very small family um, became even stronger for me at that point um, because I felt uh, very alone and very isolated in a lot of ways. And, um, uh, and that really um, became very much a part of the story. Uh, one of the bonuses that I always um, note with uh, falling in love and finding my husband was that not only did I get Kevin, uh, who was the father of my oldest son uh, at the time and then became the father of both of my sons, um, but I also got this, <laughs> that didn't come out right. You know what I mean. He sighed a sigh of relief back there. No big announcements in this story. But in Mary and Kevin, I also married into this very big family. Um, and so it was part of the bonus was that I became part, part of the Walton family, which was a um, big and boisterous family, a family that loves hard, loves strongly, um, gathers often, celebrates each other. Uh, and so um, where I would say, oh yeah, I come from the small family, and I'd always contrast that with, you know, but Kevin has this big family. Um, and it's interesting because it wasn't until years later that, and I, thinking about the narrative, that I started to think about that a little bit differently because, in fact, um, I'm not really from that small of a family. Um, so my mother was raised with uh, just one brother, uh, and my father um, grew up as an only child uh, until his, my grandparents divorced and my grandfather remarried. And so at 18, my father got his first sibling, and then at 27, he got a second sibling. So he really grew up as, a, as an um, only child. And uh, on that side, only one of my aunts ever had a child, so I have one first cousin on that side. And on my mother's side, um, I have an Uncle Billy who had um, one daughter, and so I have one first cousin on my, on my mother's side. Um, and so um, I think about uh, my mother being raised in New Orleans, the youngest of two. She has this uh, uh, brother. My grandfather 
Um, I remember as a very um, tall, striking, um, he was very uh, uh, sort of jet black, he had balding, uh, was balding, a man of sort of few words, a hard worker who I knew mostly in retirement, um, but who my mother told stories of his life um, as a Pullman porter. So he traveled on the, on the railroads. Uh, and my mother was born in 35. Um, and um, at that time, um, to be a Pullman porter was a very sort of prestigious role for an African-American um, male to have. And so he was able to support his family um, on that. Um, my grandmother, who we referred to as Nana Lena, um, stayed at home and raised her two children. And she um, was a very um, she was a petite woman. She was fair-skinned. She had long, silver-gray, sort of wavy hair that she always piled up on top of her head um, in a bun. And my mother would tell stories about um, envying her hair and wanting her hair, because my mother had very curly, um, wore her hair in a short afro. And my grandmother would always tell her, it's not what's, in your, it's not what's on your head, it's what's in your head. <laughs> um, and so that was something that, uh, that we would always hear. Um, my grandmother stayed at home and raised um, my mother and my uncle, um, Billy, who were two years apart. Um, she, my grandmother, is the oldest daughter of 13 kids, so I'm really not from a, from a small family. Um, and at 16, her mother had died, and so she raised um, all of her younger siblings, and she dropped out of school at 16 um, and raised the younger siblings in a place called Madisonville, uh, Louisiana, which is just outside of, of New Orleans. Um, and so even though I had this story of the small family, it's interesting because I can remember growing up and we always had these photo walls in, uh, in our house. And wherever we moved, the photo wall always went back up. Um, and the center of the photo wall was always sort of colored school pictures of my sister and I, the kind of school portraits that you take. And so we would be in the center of the wall. And to the left of ours was this black and white photo of my dad from you know, sort of younger, younger days. And on the right side would be my mom. And then spanned out from either side would be um, pictures of their parents, grandparents, and extended family that went from these sort of um, restored black and white photos that they had found back to actually some of the oldest photos or the sort of daguerreotype um, uh, photos. And this all hung on the wall in our house. So I always would see these photos. And my parents had done a lot of work on tracing the ancestry. And so we knew um, pieces of the family, family story. And whenever we moved, the photos went back up in some other, some other room, but always up in that same arrangement. Um, so my, um, my grandmother um, was a Heiser by birth and married into the Davis family. And so her father, um, or her grandfather, was John Henry Heiser, um, who was born in 1814 in Hamburg, Germany. And he immigrated to Louisiana, um, and he owned a, a lumber mill in Louisiana in Madisonville. And he had 11 children. And um, one of those was my, my great-grandfather, my, my, um, my great-grandfather, Theodore um, Heiser. And um, out of his second marriage, um, he had these 10 children, of which my grandmother was the oldest girl. And he had three children from his, old, from his first marriage. Um, and so I heard these stories growing up always of my mother's time in Madisonville and going and, and um, being at her grandparents' house. And, um, climbing fig trees, and she would describe what figs were to me and try to make me understand how the fig Newton that I loved was really <laughs> not from Nabisco, but <laughs> actually grew on a tree that she would climb and pick and, and um, all of this. And we went to New Orleans all the time. We have family vacations. We're always there um, to my grandmother's house, which was a, um, a small house. It felt so much bigger until going back as an adult, but it was a small house, three bedrooms, um, always filled with smells that just remind me of New Orleans. Gumbo always on the stove. My grandmother was a baker. There were always multiple pies um, of all flavors, whatever our favorite was. I always had apple. My sister had blueberry. My father had sweet potato. Um, so these were all my sort of memories of going to her, to her, um, to their home all the time. Um, and um, and my uncle was always there. My uncle. Um, Billy was the eccentric um, uncle. The family story was that he had um, faked his age in order to enlist and go to the Korean War. 
and so actually went over there when he was about 16. Um, when he came back, um, it was sort of undiagnosed, but, it, but well, I'm a psychologist now, so right, I see it as PTSD, I think is what he, what he had. Um, and so we always lived in the same bedroom that he grew up in, in my grandparents' house. Um, and uh, he would tell us things like we couldn't uh, open the door to his room because he had booby trapped his room. And we would sort of laugh and think it was funny, and my mother would be like, no, this is like serious, and stay out of Uncle Billy's room. <laughs> and like, put the fear of God in us about trying to open the, open the door to Uncle Billy's room. So he was always there. Um, and then all, extended family, my great aunt Alice would come by, and she would tell us stories about her grandchildren, which would be my second cousin. So I grew up always hearing about Monique and Rena and Allison and Billy, who are my, my cousins. Um, my two um, great uncles would come all the time, my uncle Alvin and uncle Andrew, who were my grandmother's youngest brothers, um, who looked at her like a mother because she had really raised them. Um, my uncle Andy um, drove a pickup truck and it was always a thrill of our visits because he would come get us and put us in the back of the truck and drive us all over New Orleans. Um, and I tell you all this because I, it, this extended family was always a part of my growing up and yet at some point, this narrative instead became that I have this very small family. Um, and it was interesting that this um, sort of disconnect happened um, for me at some point. Going back to the family picture wall for a, for a minute, um, I can always remember looking at the picture wall and my mother pointing to this picture of my great-grandfather, Heiser, and explaining that Heiser and that he was German. Um, and as a kid, I never realized that she was telling me that, that he was white, that German meant that he was white. Um, and it's interesting because as I look at my family, um, on both sides of the family, um, it is very obvious that there's a lot of mixture. On my father's side of the family, um, there's a whole range of skin tones. Um, and, uh, nobody has any kind of curl to their hair. Um, and it's clear that there's something other than African American. And on my um, mother's side, clearly there are these pictures that I can see and I'm told German, um, but to the family narrative was never anything other than African American and, and this um, notion of my grandfather having been, my great grandfather having been German. Um, it wasn't until I was in social, stu social studies class in elementary school um, and we lived in a, um, an area where we were the only African American family growing up. Um, and interestingly, in, in, in the social studies class, um, the teacher had put a map up of um, Europe and in giving the lesson had said, and this is where all of our ancestors are from. <laughs> and so when I came home from school, um, I had the kind of family that, you know, when asked like, how was your day? Like fine could not be the answer. Like, I, like it was necessary to, um, to give lots of explanation about what had happened in the day. So I can remember going through the sort of lesson of social studies and what we had done that day and how, you know, we were learning about Europe and how all of our ancestors are from Europe. And I thought my mother's head would explode when I said that. And at first I didn't realize, and she was like, you know, our people are not from Europe. What are you, you know, how can this teacher say this? And she's like outraged about this. And, in, um, and, and a third of my class, I grew up in Western New York at this point, and uh, um, the, my uh, town was right next to a native um, reservation, the Seneca Nation, and so not only was this little black girl sitting in the class, but a third of my class was native. So they weren't all, they also weren't from Europe. Um, and so my mother was just like incensed that this was happening. Right? But in this conversation, she says, you know, uh, other, other than the Heisers, you know, you were not from Europe. And it's the first time that I realized, oh, wait a minute, like they're white? Um, and it was a, just a sort of a new piece of the story that hadn't really, as a kid, hadn't really made sense to me when she was saying, um, saying this about Germany. So I immediately began to try to make sense and wonder about this story. So my great-grandfather would have come to Louisiana in the 1800s and, and met this, um, this black woman, this African-American woman, and married, and I wanted to understand their story. I wanted to know more about that. Um, and never got the details really filled in um, in, any sort of, in any sort of way. Um, so it remained sort of a question for me, and I created in my head what I thought that sort of love story was about. So now we've got to fast forward to 2014, and one of the things that um, Kevin and I like to do, or at least he plays along, because I drag him to a lot of theater, and we go to see plays. Um, and New Haven is a great place to go see plays. And so we, um, and typically, our styles are very different. Um, 
And so when I see a play that's coming and I will tend to research it and I'll look it up and I'll find out what the play's about and then we settle into our seats and we have the playbill and I'll read the playbill and I'll know everything about the play. And Kevin's approach to the coming to the theater is typically just to, hey, you wanna go? Okay, let's go. He settles down and sees what's gonna come in front of him. So for some reason, this um, play was coming to Yale Rep and um, I wanted to go see it and I didn't do any of my normal research. So I didn't really know what it was gonna be. Um, but I knew enough that I knew I wanted to go see it, and it was called The House That Would Not Stand. I don't know if anybody went to the Yale Rep to see that. Um, and so it wasn't until I was sitting in the Yale Rep, and I had the playbill that I started to read the playbill before the play started. And in reading it, I started to understand it's a story that's set in 1830s, like 1836, something like that, um, in New Orleans. And the New Orleans piece was what made me want to go see it, but I didn't know anything more about it. Um, and it's about this whole community of white men that have side relationships with black women that have these whole separate families. And all of a sudden, while sitting in this play, I had this like existential panic that that was my family story. That, that this, that I, what I didn't really understand about this German heiser um, coming to Louisiana and finding my grandmother, all of a sudden, I started thinking was this other relationship that just sort of changed for me. If it were true, it changed for me how I was thinking about it because it didn't fit this sort of love story that I had thought it was. It became something um, different. And so that just sparked even more. I had to understand what this story was and I didn't know at this point now, my mother's been dead for years. My grandmother has died, I'm, right? My narrative is I have this small family. I'm not connected anymore to anybody. I talked to my sister and she'd be like, you're the one who knew the family stories. Like, she, I don't know. So she didn't fill in anything for me. Um, and so I discovered this amazing thing called Ancestry.com. <laughs> and I became obsessed. And Kevin would see me at the computer and be like, are, like what are you doing? And I would be obsessed with Ancestry.com. And I created my account and I logged in and I was just going to figure this out. And I started with just the little things like, and as I started typing things in, I was amazed that like memories would come back and I'd like realize, oh, I remembered names that I hadn't remembered and it's starting to fill in. But the amazing thing about Ancestry.com is other people are building trees and, and it's tapping into all of this information that's out there. And so you get these little hints that pop up as these amazing little green leaves. Does anyone do Ancestry? It is like, it's addictive. And so, so not only when you're on it, but then you'll get emails like telling you that you got a hint and you have to go and look onto the hint. And so I just became a mad woman about trying to fill in my tree and mostly my mother's side of the tree, but I learned amazing things on my father's side. I learned that we were Cuban, that I had no idea on my father's side of the family. So all this stuff came in because I started to see these documents um, that I could see actual census records that are handwritten and the family names all filled in and occupations and um, I found um, military records and draft cards and all sorts of things and I found the marriage license of my great-grandpa Heiser and my great-grandmother and so for, for, so it wasn't the story of the house that would not stand. It went back to being what I thought it would be um, about this, uh, about the family. But as I looked at it, this tree that was filling out, it was really amazing to start to see and to start to all of a sudden change that not only does Kevin come from a big family, but that I also come from this big family. Um, and the main difference was that Kevin knew his family, was connected to them, and that I had, um, for all sorts of reasons at this point, lost touch with that. Um, and so continue through this Ancestry.com and there is one other amazing tool if you want to do any kind of connection. I may be the only person that still loves Facebook, but Facebook became this other jewel for me around this. And through um, a, a couple of um, strange interactions, I was actually talking with a woman that um, is a friend of mine here and she was traveling back and forth to um, New Orleans to care for a, a, a sick um, parent. And Shawana and I were talking one day and she mentioned that she was going back and forth to New Orleans. I said, oh, you know, my family's from New Orleans. And she said, oh. Um, and she said, what's your family's name? Um, and so I said, well, you know, my mother was a Davis. She's from the Heisers. And my grandmother was, you know, Angelina Davis. And my grandfather was William Davis. And Shawana just stops and looks at me. And she's like, Angelina Davis? <laughs> 
And I was like, uh, yeah. She's like, on Law Street? And I was like, yeah. And it turns out that Shawana's grandmother and my grandmother are best friends. And Shawana starts sending me picture, we're best friends, my grandmother passed away. Um, and she starts sending me pictures of my grandmother and my great aunt at Shawana's birthday parties when she's like three. Um, and so through Shawana's friend network on Facebook, because you know you can see who you have friends in common and everything, I find my second cousins. Um, and so I get connected to these four cousins um, that I used to, to grow up hearing about, Monique, Rena, Allison, and Billy. Um, and I find Rena on Facebook, and so I send her this crazy friend request with a note, and like, you probably don't remember who I am, or whatever. And she writes back, like, within like a half an hour, like, cousin, <laughs> and and my mama's on too, and you got to friend her, and like, just starts to. So we started making plans about um, trying to. So they live in California. They were always the cousins in California. Um, and so we started making plans about how we were, and I'm telling my sister all this, and my sister thinks I'm crazy, because you know, when I first told her I found Cuban, and I'm like, we're Cuban, and I'm telling her how, and she writes back to me in a text, and she's like, so you mean we're like 132nd Cuban? <laughs> I'm like, you're being a killjoy, just go with me. So I'm trying to get her excited about this. So, so we started thinking about it. So before I get a chance to get out to um, California, though, um, Shawana actually called me um, one morning and tells me, I don't know if you've heard yet, but your, um, your aunt Alice, she's actually my cousin Alice, um, passed away. And I said, oh my goodness, I really wanted to get out, get out there. And she and my mom would have kind of grown up together, so she was like a link to my mom and filling in some of the stories, and I had wanted to do that. And so I'm like kicking myself, like I can't believe, like we said we'd go, and I didn't go. And so I said to Kevin, I'm going to this funeral. And, um, and I just needed to go, and I needed to go and reconnect that. And, um, and so this would have been in March of this year. And so I tried to get my sister to go with me, and she had just come back from California for work, and she couldn't swing it to go again. So she's like, you go and check them out and see. <laughs> and between the two of my sister is the extrovert. My sister is the like, go out into the world, make the friends, and then bring them back to me um, person. <laughs> And I got to just, you know, tag along and be her shadow for, for growing up. And so it was very out of character for me to like get on this plane and go to LA by myself without my big sister. But I said, I'm gonna do it. Um, and so I flew to California in March um, to go to my cousin Alice's funeral. And um, not only did I reconnect with my four cousins um, who were just, I mean, it was like, it was like no time had passed. Um, I mean, but I also met, um, all sorts of other family members, um, cousins, extended cousins, and just started to fill in the story and just this sense of just huge family. Um, and like we all look alike and um, it was so clear that we were all family. Um, and so when talking with one of my cousins there, um, she says to me, well, aren't, aren't, like you're on the, the Heiser website, aren't you? And I'm like, there's a website? <laughs> she's, like, she's like, yeah, um, you know, there's a, there's a website and you've gotta go on it. It's got all the family reunion information and everything. So um, when I get home, I you know, Google this Heiser website to find out. Um, and on it, there is a link to, um, to the family genealogy. And so I click on the link and it opens up this. And so here's my prop. My prop. This 38-page genealogy of like the generations going back to my great 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 grandfather, the generations of Heisers and then the kids that are all over and um, and information. And so my narrative is forever changed from feeling like I'm from a small family to now feeling rooted back in um, in a family that um, that is. Uh, very important to me, and now back into my life. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm relieved to know that both of them are mine. <laughs> Um, she said boisterous. I thought that was a good word. <laughs> a good word. Read between the lines. Yeah. <laughs>
So, um, well, you know, thank you. And, and you know, we, I was happy to take that journey with you in terms of going back, um, you know, doing the ancestry thing like that. And I never bothered to do it because, well, we know where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> it's comedy hour today. Any questions? Yes. I, I, I'm struck by being 17 and being orphaned. And I know that part of your story is that you went to Yale. And I'm curious about if you went to Yale at 17 or what that yeah. time was for you and your sister. Yeah. Um, so um, it's interesting when I, when I think of story and it, you know, Claudia was like, I don't have a story. And, and um, for me, it was my story had become really one thing. Um, and part of t exploring this story was to sort of broaden my narrative and get it back to that I had a very rich life. So my story was not just about the fact that my parents died at 17, but in a lot of ways it had become that and I, I led with that. Um, the reason that that was so significant to me is because they were so significant for the 17 years that I had them. So um, my, my mother was diagnosed when I was 16 with pancreatic cancer. And um, that at the time, and I don't know if it's changed, but that was always a very um, difficult diagnosis to have. It was, there was really only one course that pancreatic cancer was going to take. And so our life became about preparing for her um, ultimate death. Um, my father, um, unexpectedly, um, was being treated for something else, and in the course of that, discovered that he had lung cancer. Um, and my father went, underwent a whole series of aggressive treatments and experimental treatments that confined the cancer to one lung. And so his prognosis was actually very good. He was going to have one lobe removed of his lungs um, and was thought to be able to live you know, many years um, with one lung. Uh, unfortunately, his heart stopped on the operating table, and so he never came out of surgery. Um, and so uh, my father died in August, um, uh, about a week and a half before I was to leave for Yale. And um, my sister and her boyfriend at the time, who's now my brother-in-law, uh, packed my stuff in our family car and uh, drove me to uh, New Haven and left me on old campus. <laughs> with a bunch of folks that I didn't know, um, but people who became um, my angels and who uh, literally, very literally saved my life um, in friendships that I made at Yale um, and people that, that saw the pain that I was in. My mother died in October of that year. Um, and so um, we went, I, she had us come home for our Columbus Day weekend um, to say goodbye and she was gone about a week later. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's, it's part of the story of how New Haven became home um, because my sister, was, um, my sister was a junior at Harvard and I was a freshman here and, um, and we had no home base anymore. Um, and so New Haven became my home. Yeah. There's a question in the back. I recognize that one. So I know you were wrong talking about how the um, lady, Ms. Shawana, like kind of like told you a whole bunch of stuff about your family. Yeah. Is there anything like that's like kind of like, like I don't want to say funny, but like that's something that's just like good to know, like especially like that's important in both of y'all lives? Anything that I learned through Shawana? Well, like or something that's like you already knew that was just like important. I feel like this is a leading question. Like that, like that you have. So that's our, those are our sons in the back. That's, that's Kevin Jr. and Caleb. Caleb is posing the question. Um, so I mean, I think what, what I really appreciate with, with um, Shawana was having that, that connection as somebody else who knew some of my family story. Um, and because I had lost track of so many, um, so many of my cousins at that point or whatever, that, that, that connection. And so, she was able to fill in her own memories of my grandparents that I never would have had and my, my great aunts. I think we have time for uh, one more, one or two more. Anybody?
All right. So, um, well, thank you all. Thank you. I think we have a, a couple of announcements to make, though. So, um...